Thank you, and thank you all for having us today. My name is Jeff Blackwood. I'm with the Fertilizer Institute in Washington, D.C. And for those who may not be familiar, the Fertilizer Institute is the trade association for the commercial fertilizer industry here in the U.S. I had a couple people yesterday on the farm tour ask me, well, why is a commercial fertilizer guy here at this manure management conference? Um, but as Rick Cole said this morning, agribusiness is industry is making a sincere effort at increasing sustainability and nutrient management is something that affects us all. So I'm happy to be here today. I'm going to talk through some regulatory issues that affect nutrient management, specifically the Clean Water Act. We'll get into uh, water quality criteria, total maximum daily loads, nutrient stewardship, and then we'll finish up with some legislation that affects nutrient management. Uh, my co-presenter today, I tend to have kind of a, a field and row crop perspective on things, so I asked Ashley McDonald with the National Cattlemen's to join me for the presentation today to bring a livestock focus to some of these issues. So Ashley. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Again, my name is Ashley McDonald, and I am Deputy Environmental Counsel for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association in Washington, D.C. Uh, so in that role, I am in charge of regulatory issues under the Clean Water Act as well as the Clean Air Act uh, that affect the beef cattle industry across the country. Um, and so there are lots of issues, as you might imagine, lots of water issues. Um, and then at the end, if we have a little bit of time, I might touch on just uh, one or two air issues as well that, um, that we're dealing with. So, Jeff, turn it back over to you. Thanks, Ashley. So the first slide here, this is a press release that was issued by EPA just last week. Uh, EPA commissioned a study on the health of the nation's waterways, and the study came back and found that 55 percent of the nation's stream miles are in poor condition for supporting aquatic life. Now, this isn't just related to nutrients in the waters, but nutrients are a big part of the problem uh, with water quality. So when we talk about addressing this problem at the national level, we're talking about the Clean Water Act. Uh, that's the regulatory framework through which this is addressed. The Clean Water Act came into place uh, back in 1972. Before that, there was a federal water pollution law dating to 1948, but really the Clean Water Act as we know it came into place in 1972. Uh, quick overview of what the Clean Water Act looks like. It all starts with water quality standards, which can be numeric or narrative. Uh, the Clean Water Act delegates the authority of states to monitor their waters if they are meeting the water quality standards, everything's good. They apply anti-degradation measures to ensure they continue meeting those standards. If they don't, they fall under uh, what's called the 303D list for impaired waters. And then it falls to the state to come up with implementation strategies to improve water quality. And that can be through total maximum daily loads or TMDLs. Uh, other strategies, which we won't really get into today, uh, include NPDES permits, sections 319 for non-point sources, as well as sections 401 and 404. So talking about water quality standards, these are intended to achieve a designated use, and that could be uses like drinking water, direct contact for swimming, non-contact like boating or fish consumption. Criteria can be narrative or criteria can be uh, numeric. Numeric criteria are quantitative measures like seven-day average of five milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen, whereas uh, narrative criteria, the traditional narrative criteria, is no toxic and toxic amounts. Uh, TFI has always argued that numeric criteria aren't always appropriate for nutrients, uh, since some nitrogen and phosphorus are needed in waterways to support a healthy ecosystem. But that's not the case for other pollutants where the ideal level in the waters is zero. We're going to look at a couple specific areas in the country where numeric nitrant criteria are an issue, specifically in Florida and the Mississippi River Basin. Oops. So in the case of Florida, um, we're kind of at the tail end of a, a long process um, where Florida and the US EPA went back and forth about who would set the water quality criteria in the state of Florida. As I said, the Clean Water Act delegates that authority to the states. But in August of 2008, 
uh, environmental advocacy groups sued EPA for not establishing numeric nutrient criteria for Florida's surface waters. In January 2009, EPA determined that statewide numeric criteria were necessary for Florida to be in compliance with the Clean Water Act. At that point, EPA committed to promulgating phosphorus and nitrogen criteria for Florida's waters, which they did in January of 2010. Uh, around that same time, the state of Florida, Florida's Department of Environmental Protection, also proposed criteria for some waters. This proposal passed the Florida legislature and was signed by the governor and sent to EPA for an approval. So this was an attempt by Florida to retain control of their state water quality standards. So we had a long period where nothing really happened on this, and some of the more cynical folks might say that the Obama administration and the, uh, the EPA were waiting for the election last year to pass before they uh, did something so controversial in a swing state like Florida. Uh, lo and behold, uh, last November, late November of 2012, the EPA approved Florida DEP's partial state criteria, but they also proposed criteria for waters that were not covered by that state criteria. And then just last month, uh, in March, Florida DEP and the EPA reached an agreement calling for additional legislation that will put the state in its charge, put the state in charge of determining numeric limits on nutrients in state waterways. So back in the midst of all this, uh, TFI, the Fertilizer Institute, challenged EPA's efforts to impose numeric nutrient criteria in Florida. And we were joined uh, in that suit by national cattlemen's, Florida cattlemen's, and other interested parties uh, like Florida Wastewater Control and Florida Utilities also joined in that lawsuit. Um, the result of that lawsuit ended in a decision in the U.S. District Court to vacate EPA's proposed stream standard based on lack of scientific grounding. And that decision set the stage for the recent EPA FDEP agreement. So that's where we stand now. This headline was also just uh, two weeks ago in a newspaper in Florida. Uh, so the result of all this, uh, after a great deal of lit uh, litigation, action at the state capitol, action at U.S. EPA and in Florida's region, uh, but Florida will retain control of setting their water quality criteria. Uh, the proposal uh, is moving through the legislature now, and it should be uh, signed by the governor uh, in short order and then has to be approved by EPA, which they've given pre-approval. So we certainly expect that to happen. Uh, this is a, publish, a map that's published by Florida DEP. It shows the result of all this. Um, the various shades of blue are waterways that are covered by Florida's numeric nutrient criteria. Uh, this shows uh, inland flowing lakes, in, uh, sorry, inland flowing waters, freshwater lakes, estuaries, and then the purple there is the Everglades. So we're kind of at the end of uh, the process for this Florida numeric nutrient criteria. Next, Ashley's going to talk a little about the Mississippi River system and a proposal for numeric nutrient criteria there. Ashley? Sure. Well, obviously what happened in, in Florida was very concerning because of the precedent that it could set for the rest of the country. Um, and one of the areas that we thought uh, EPA or environmentalist groups would go next is the Mississippi River Basin, and that's exactly what has happened. Uh, in 2008, actually, environmentalist groups actually petitioned EPA to set numeric nutrient criteria and find that it was necessary in the Mississippi River Basin. Um, in 2011, EPA answered that uh, petition by denying it. Uh, they denied the, that petition um, and, and said that they would not set numeric nutrient criteria in the Mississippi River Basin, uh, partly because of what happened uh, in Florida. Uh, it was very political, and, and we all know what happened down there with the court case as well. Uh, in March of 2012, environmentalist groups actually sued EPA um, based on the denial of that petition. Um, and so that has led now to the litigation that we're currently in in the Mississippi River Basin. Now, obviously, this affects the agriculture industry greatly. Uh, as you can see on the, on the map, obviously, this is an, an enormous uh, river basin. It's one-third of the contiguous United States, um, and it covers a lot of the Corn Belt. It, ca it covers... Uh, what somebody I heard earlier say, the beef belt, uh, I like that term, um, and, and the other livestock groups as well. So it's very concerning, um, and it will be 
an extreme challenge if, if EPA would go down this route. So what has happened um, recently is in the litigation is that EPA actually did issue a statement reaffirming um, their letter denying the request that numeric nutrient criteria are not necessary in the Mississippi River Basin. Um, and, and that was reassuring to agriculture groups because uh, because what can happen in litigation, like what happened in the state of Florida, uh, is whenever EPA is sued by environmentalist groups, uh, we get very fearful that they will just enter into a settlement agreement uh, and agree to rulemakings and regulations that greatly affect our industry, uh, that we have no opportunity uh, to be part of those discussions or, or part of um, any decision-making process. Um, so it's very concerning. So what happened when they, when they uh, got sued based on the denial of, of the petition was we had a, a number of groups, um, agriculture groups as well as states, actually intervene in the, legislation, or in the litigation. Um, and the purpose of that was to make it very difficult on EPA to enter into a settlement agreement and agree to do numeric nutrient criteria, just like they did in the state of Florida for the Mississippi River Basin. Um, so here's again a timeline of that that you can see. Um, in mid-2012 is when we had 13 states actually intervene um, on behalf of the agency in support of the denial um, of the petition. Um, and so that's very telling about how important this litigation is, is that you had 13 states actually come um, and join the litigation which doesn't happen that often. Uh, you also had a number of agriculture groups uh, intervene in the litigation. The Fertilizer Institute that Jeff represents was one of them, American Farm Bureau, the National Pork Producers Council, the Ag Retailers Association, and the National Corn Growers are all part of that litigation that's going on. Um, and they submitted a, a joint memorandum as interveners in opposition to the plaintiffs and in support of EPA. And Jeff's going to talk um, a little bit, since he's actually part of this litigation, uh, he's going to talk specifically about what their brief uh, is arguing. Thanks, Ashley. And uh, all we said was that the plaintiffs failed to show in this case that the, uh, the necessity of EPA setting a multi-state numeric nutrient criteria for the basin and taking that power away from each individual state to do. Uh, we also argue that the Clean Water Act specifically gave deference to the states in setting their water quality standards, and that the plaintiffs failed to show that the states in the basin are failing to improve water quality standards. So those are the two hot topics for water quality standards. Moving further down into the Clean Water Act, uh, we're going to talk now about uh, impaired waters on the 303D list, and specifically about uh, total maximum daily loads, or TMDLs. So as most of you know, a TMDL sets the maximum amount of a pollutant that a water body can receive and still meet the water quality standards set forth for it. Uh, across the country, there are about 4,000 TMDLs that have been listed, and 6,800 of those TMDLs list nutrients as the cause of impairment. We're going to look at one high-profile watershed where a TMDL is under development. Um, this is the Illinois River uh, that runs between Arkansas and Oklahoma. This portion here is northwestern Arkansas. It's a very productive poultry region. The river starts up here, the watershed starts up here, and then flows. This is the state border between Arkansas and Oklahoma. It flows over this way near Tahlequah, Oklahoma, and then down into Lake Tenkiller, where it's a very popular recreational area. And Ashley's going to talk briefly about this oh, team deal. Uh, so uh, what happened here is, again, like everything uh, that I feel like I deal with, uh, it all started with uh, some litigation uh, between the state of Oklahoma. Um, and actually, this litigation started, um, they actually sued Tyson's uh, poultry operation. So they were going after the poultry industry because of the phosphorus uh, that uh, ran off pastures and fields um, that was applied. Um, and uh, and I'll touch on that actual litigation a little bit later, but uh, what ended up happening is, is that Oklahoma actually asked EPA to do a TMDL for phosphorus, 
um, in this river. And the state of Arkansas was obviously not very happy about that um, because they knew exactly what that would mean for their state. <clears throat> and then in 2009, EPA actually uh, had developed a TMDL, but then the states uh, actually ended up agreeing that they would delay it for three years uh, because they thought it, they needed more study um, and in development of a model that could better predict um, a TMDL. Um, so that's what's been occurring over the last three years, that actually they're in the process of just finalizing the, the, the validation of that model, um, and they are supposed to have a proposed TMDL come out of that model in May of this year. Um, and then after that, they'll, they'll go through the public comment process like they're required to. Um, and then a final TMDL will be set in the fall of this year. Um, but again, the, the ramifications on the poultry industry um, due to this TMDL are, are quite substantial, and it's something that we can continue, continue to see um, across the country. Okay. Thanks, Ashley. So that's an example of one fairly straightforward but high-profile TMDL. Next, we're going to look at kind of the mother of all TMDLs, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. Uh, this is the largest TMDL ever developed by EPA, and as you can see, it identifies the reductions of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, sediment across six states from New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, as well as the District of Columbia. So there are actually 294 individual TMDLs, uh, part of the Bay TMDL, one for each of the three pollutants and in each of 98 impaired bay segments. And so just looking at Maryland, for example, Maryland drains to 58 of the segments and will be subject to 174 individual TMDLs. So the TMDL sets bay watershed limits requiring a 25% reduction in nitrogen, a 24% reduction in phosphorus, and a 20% reduction in sediment by 2025. So according to EPA, agriculture is the largest source to the bay of nitrogen at 45 percent, phosphorus at 65 percent, and sediments at 65 percent. And this is obviously, this includes fertilizer use, tillage, and manure in that number. So how does the Chesapeake Bay TMDL actually work? Uh, so it's up to each state to develop a watershed implementation plan, or WIP, and we're now in the phase two WIPs that the states have submitted and are submitting to EPA for approval. Um, EPA established the Bay TMDL and allocated to each state the, uh, uh, the reductions required within that state. Now they've set two-year milestones. EPA will monitor the progress of the states in implementing their WIPs and then uh, employ federal steps if progress is inadequate. So another example, just looking at Maryland, of what is included in the WIP, it goes down to the county level and uh, includes such things as the wastewater treatment facility is going to reduce phosphorus by X amount uh, by this year. Um, it also spells out they're going to clean up um, septic systems that have failed within the county. And then at the statewide level, it has a nutrient management plan, not just for animal feeding operations, but for crop operations as well. And in this case, uh, Farm Bureau, TFI, the National Association of Home Builders, and others have sued, arguing that the EPA overstepped its legal authority and encroached on the state's responsibilities by setting those specific allocations for nitrogen. Uh, the suit also questions the validity of the models used to help establish nutrient loads in the TMDL. And in this case, oral arguments were heard last October. Uh, we're unsure how much longer until a decision is reached, but it could be any day. So those uh, are a look at some of the big regulatory trends across the country that are affecting nutrient management. Um, on the fertilizer, fertilizer industry side of things, we have launched a nutrient stewardship program, a voluntary uh, nutrient stewardship program within the industry several years ago. Um, we actually have a full-time staffer that administers this program for TFI. Some of you may know Laura Moody. She was a former attendee at this uh, conference in her capacity at Iowa State. But she heads this program for us. So, many of you are probably familiar with the four R's. I heard them mentioned in a presentation this morning. But four R's uh, are the, using the right fertilizer source at the right rate, at the right time, and at the right place.
So the 4R nutrient stewardship framework is globally applicable. It can be applied to a diverse range of agriculture systems, types, and sizes. It's site-specific, so it can be applied in areas of rangeland and pasture or greenhouse production or small gardens. Uh, it's not one practice or one plan. It can be applied to a diverse range of soils and diverse range of climates. And the overarching goal of 4Rs is to match nutrient supply with crop requirements and to minimize nutrient losses from farm fields. And it's ab absolutely applicable to manure and organic fertilizer applications, just like it is commercial fertilizer. And I should also mention that uh, the 4R framework was included in the National 590 Nutrient Standard. So here's one example of uh, where the 4R uh, framework has been adopted uh, as a nutrient management strategy. This is Lake Erie. You can see on the map, uh, the photo was taken by NOAA. This was in uh, the summer of 2011. Lake Erie has had a recurring problem with algae blooms. That's what this is here in the western edge of the lake. Uh, this is Cleveland here. This is Detroit up here. Um, but Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio all drain uh, into the western Lake Erie basin there. And so this algae bloom was creating problems for water quality health, and it's disrupting commercial and sport fishery in the western Lake Erie basin. And so TFI worked with our retail members in that region to really get the word out about 4R nutrient stewardship to their farmer customers in that area. We also partnered with the Nature Conservancy to spread the word about 4R nutrient stewardship. And uh, in October of 2011, the Ohio Department of Agriculture, the Ohio EPA, and the Ohio Department of Natural Resources adopted the 4Rs as official nutrient management policy. And then last summer, in June of 2012, the Ohio State Legislature created the Healthy Lake Erie Fund, which set aside $3 million to help implement uh, the 4R framework in that state. So that's uh, what the industry is doing uh, to address uh, nutrient management. Um, but now we're going to talk a little bit about Farm Bill. Um, you know, the Farm Bill uh, current status, we're under a continuing, uh, we're under an extension for the Farm Bill that expires in September of this year. It was passed in the continuing resolution that's funding all of the federal government right now. Um, currently, the House and Senate Ag Committee staffs are negotiating, uh, trying to get um, uh, the framework for the new Farm Bill, uh, find areas of agreement. In the last Congress, both the Senate Agriculture Committee and the House Agriculture Committee passed farm bills that were substantially similar, similar aside from a few notable differences. Uh, so much of that work is going to transfer over into this new Congress uh, and will be the starting point for the new Farm Bill. And we expect markups to occur uh, either later this month or, or early next month. So within the Farm Bill, the primary impact on nutrient management falls under the conservation title. As I mentioned, uh, the House and Senate Ag Committees passed Farm Bills last year. Uh, both of those bills consolidated 23 existing conservation programs into four fundamental program functions. At the same time, it achieved $6 billion in deficit reduction. So the four program areas are working lands programs, conservation reserve program, regional conservation partnerships, and easements programs. And so as you can see under working lands programs, that includes uh, EQIP, CSP, and conservation innovation grants. And under the EQIP program, they did keep in place the 60-40 split for funding with 60% going to livestock producers. Just a last word on Farm Bill and where do we go from here. Um, you know, every conversation in Washington right now is uh, about uh, budget and fiscal policy. So uh, there undoubtedly will be some cuts made to the Farm Bill uh, that the Congress works on this year. Aside from that, um, we are now operating under sequestration cuts that went into effect on September 30, um, uh, that will be in effect until September 30, rather. Uh, most USDA discretionary programs were cut by 5 percent. Farm Bill commodity and conservation programs were cut by 6 percent under sequestration, and that, that has to go into place between now and September 30. Congress did pass a few weeks ago a continuing resolution that granted authority for some flexibility for USDA to move money around between programs, but the top line number is the same. 
Uh, currently, CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, estimates the current Farm Bill will cost, over the next 10 years, $975 billion. So that's kind of the starting point that the Ag Committees will have to work on for Farm Bill funding. Uh, the only question is how much are they going to cut from there. So an early indicator we have of that, uh, just two weeks ago, both the House and the Senate passed budgets uh, for the coming year. The House passed budget would cut the Farm Bill by $184 billion, while the Senate passed budget would cut the Farm Bill by $23 billion. So it remains to be seen what happens from there, uh, but like I said, they should start markups uh, within the next month or so. And now Ashley's going to talk about some uh, livestock-specific uh, issues for nutrient management. Sure. Well, a lot of you might be aware of some of these, um, but uh, as a lawyer, I can't get out of a presentation without talking a little bit, little bit more about litigation um, and the effect that it has on regulations and our operations in general. Um, so the first three you see there, 2004, we had dairies in Waco, Texas that were sued by the city of Waco for phosphorus. Um, we, in 2005 in, in Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma sued Tyson, as I mentioned earlier, with that um, Illinois River watershed um, due to phosphorus concerns. Um, and in 2003, just recently, um, a group of five dairies were sued in Washington State in Yakima uh, Valley due to nitrates. Um, and those were sued by uh, a group of envi local environmentalist groups. Um, and so those are the threats that, that actual individual operations um, can face. Um, and I can tell you as representing uh, a large segment of the livestock industry and those producers that um, it is something that they take very seriously um, and that weighs on their mind most nights is the legal liability that not only comes from uh, litigation under citizen suits under the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act, um, but also from things like, um, you know, TMDLs, numeric nutrient criteria, all those things um, have legal liability uh, for individual producers. In 2005, looking specifically at the Clean Water Act CAFO rule, um, we had a litigation, uh, a decision uh, under the Waterkeeper decision that uh, said that nutrient management plan terms must be part of the permits. Uh, MPDES permits. So we've been doing that over the last few years. Um, and then we had a settlement agreement in 2009 with the Chesapeake Bay, we, not, not I, EPA and uh, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation had a settlement agreement. Um, and this agreement uh, just keeps on giving over the years. Um, <laughs> one thing it did is you all might have heard of the 308 livestock reporting rule uh, that was withdrawn last year after it was proposed by EPA the year before. Um, also part of that settlement agreement, it says that EPA will propose more stringent permitting requirements for land application of manure, litter, or processed wastewater. Um, what the environmentalist groups want is to get a third-party manure liability. Uh, so they, don't, they want the CAFO uh, to be legally held legally responsible um, for manure, whether it is sold to somebody else in land applied, they are still going to be legally responsible um, that that manure gets applied according to a nutrient management plan uh, in an agronomic fashion. Um, and obviously, you might imagine that we have a, a pretty big problem with that. Um, the other uh, item under that settlement agreement is to expand the universe of CAFOs, um, whether that means to lower the, the head count number for large CAFOs. It's currently at 1,000 head for beef cattle. Um, or whether that means focusing inspections and designations of medium and small operations, which we're already seeing in states like uh, Iowa and Idaho and some other states where they're focusing um, inspections on those smaller operations. So uh, it said all those items uh, have to be proposed in a rule that uh, is scheduled now. It was supposed to be last year, but now it's been moved to April, the end of April of this year, so just the end of this month we should see a, a Chesapeake Bay rule. Uh, the important thing to remember is EPA is not required to just have this rule impact the Chesapeake Bay. It could be a national rule that affects all livestock operations. Um, and so that, that rule is scheduled to have a final rule out in uh, the spring of 2014. Um, and as was talked about in, in quite a few sessions earlier, the 590 standard, that's something the NCBA was involved in um, at the national level um, because Things like prohibitions on, on all applications on snow-covered or frozen ground, um, things like that really affect our industry, and so we were very involved in that. And as you all know, that uh, the state standards um, have were scheduled to be
completed by January of this year, um, and we're currently reviewing all those phosphorus indices across the states, um, which again our producers rely on completely for their application rates. The one issue, uh, the one air issue, I wanted to touch on real quick because it's, it's been the uh, such a topic. Um, from this morning through a lot of the sessions uh, is ammonia and um, Mr. Ham this morning described, uh, said that there's always a petition for ammonia to be regulated as a pollutant under the Clean Air Act. And there always are those petitions. Um, EPA has a petition sitting in front of it right now um, that they made sure I knew about the last time I talked to him a few weeks ago. Um, and one thing that did happen, it's not specifically on ammonia as a regulated or as a criteria pollutant um, like NOx or SOx or particulate matter or some of those other ones are under the Clean Air Act. But under the PM 2.5, the fine particulate matter standard, uh, a January 4th decision by the DC Circuit actually said that EPA was not allowed to, to use a provision of the Clean Air Act that gave them the more flexibility to find and tell states that they did not have to regulate ammonia as a precursor to PM 2.5. Instead, they are required to use a different provision of the Clean Air Act uh, that does require uh, precursors of pollutants, of the pollutant in question here, PM 2.5. Uh, they are going to be regulated, they could be regulated pollutants. So, uh, so ammonia is, is very much at the forefront of, of the battle and, and from the National Cattlemen's Beef Association's perspective perspective will be the, the big deal in Washington, D.C. over the next 10 years probably. Um, so we are, we are dealing with that. What will happen with that ruling is in 2014 we will have a new PM 2.5 implementation rule because the new standards were just set in December of 2012. So we now not only have, have to revise a previous implementation rule, but we now have a lowered standard as well, which of course will increase the number of quote unquote non-attainment areas, those areas not meeting the PM 2.5 standard. Um, and so any PM 2.5 non-attainment area could be, based on what this rule would say, could require states to regulate sources of ammonia. Um, so <laughs> always doom and gloom from my perspective, but um, that's usually what happens in Washington, D.C. So, um, so those are a couple of the, the issues that I wanted to make sure I touched on before, before we finish today. Thanks, Ashley. So we've covered a wide range of topics, and uh, time permitting, we're happy to answer any questions. So questions? Any questions for Jeff?